morning. Hey, this is great. See a lot of old faces and a whole bunch of new ones this morning. So thank you for coming to see what's happening with the city of Montrose in our What's Happening in 2020. So I'm Judy Ann Files. Thank you for being here. I am this morning's facilitator. And we're just going to jump straight into this because you see this lineup over there and they're all just dying to talk. So, okay, Bill Bell. Bill Bell, city manager, city of Montreux. So Kathy asked me to do a mic check. You already took care of that, it sounds like. So everybody can hear us in the back? Is that good? Okay, excellent. So I'm gonna run through and introduce the people we have with us today. I'm gonna to share with you our mission statement, briefly go over that, and then kick it over and they're gonna run down in this order. And then I'll finish us off at the end talking a little bit about our budget and some big projects we're currently working on. So starting right here, Blaine Hall, our police chief, Jim Scheid, our public works manager, Ann Morgan Thaler, our assistant city manager, Scott Murphy, our city engineer, and Chelsea Rossi, our director of business innovation and tourism. And then I'm Bill Bell, the city manager. So quickly, we wanted to show you our mission statement, put it up on the screen for you. There's been a lot of questions lately on why does the city do the things they do? So really, everything we do is based on a couple big guiding principles or plans. We have our city comprehensive plan. So that gives us a 20 year vision for the community. A lot of community input went into the old uh, comprehensive plan. We're currently working, and Ann will tell you about our new comprehensive planning efforts, but that drives our big picture vision for the next 10 to 20 years. And so everything we do is related back to that plan. We also want to use the mission statement we created several years ago with input from all of our employees and our department heads and council at the time. And we want to focus on a few things just to highlight them for you. And then as we're talking about projects, you can think about how that relates to this mission statement. So the Montrose lifestyle, we really want to promote that in our community. We have an attractive community for not only people across Colorado, but across the country, because we have an active lifestyle here. We have an outdoor-based recreation lifestyle. All year round, you can go out of your house and do great things. And we have a lot of retirees and people moving into our community who want to stay active, and that's one main reason they choose Montrose as their home base. Innovation is really important to us. Although we recently lost our Director of Innovation and Citizen Engagement because our colleagues at Region 10 stole him from us, Virgil Turner. <laughs> we still like him, he can still sit with us over here, it's totally fine. <laughs> we have now, Ann will tell you, backfilled his position with a couple different types of positions and spread out the workload to make sure that we're still trying to be as innovative as possible and engaging the citizenry. So innovation is really important to us. We don't want to do traditional government services in the old traditional ways. We want to do those in new, creative, and innovative ways. Service-oriented leadership is really important to us. We partner with a lot of our nonprofits in our community, and we provide a lot of community service to the community of Montrose. And then, of course, building leadership in the community is really important, and we want our community to be known as leaders in the region and across the state, and we do that on a variety of fronts. So I'm going to hand it off to Ann. Good morning. I'm Ann Morgan Thaler, the Assistant City Manager. Thank you for having us here and for coming on this cold and snowy day. I'm going to talk a little bit about our comprehensive plan, like Bill said, also community events and outreach, and the partnerships that we have with other community organizations here in Montrose. First, this is a picture from one of our downtown meetings that we had as part of our comprehensive planning process. It was focused on um, the downtown area. It was a workshop, and we had over 50 people come and join us. And it was in what's known as the KP building on South First and Cascade, which is right now vacant, but we were able to get in there thanks to Chelsea Rosti and use that space and host the community meeting to start really thinking about what we love about our downtown and what community members want downtown to be like in the future. And it was just an excellent space to have this meeting and we've been lucky enough to have really good participation from the community during our comprehensive planning process. I see a lot of people who were there during those meetings. Tammy, I think you're at every single one of them, thank you. Um, and we'll be doing that in 2020 as well. 
So we'll be continuing those efforts. Right now our planning team is working on the draft goals and objectives. We have a community comprehensive planning committee as well. And so we hope you'll join us in the summertime as we continue those efforts and look at our draft plans and then make comments. Here on the right are some pictures from our comprehensive planning process. We're already seeing some new themes emerge that weren't as important or weren't vocalized as much in our last plan. Things like affordable housing came up a lot. And we're also hearing from community members that you'd like for the city to partner with other organizations to facilitate things happening and to make sure that we allow and encourage things like affordable housing as opposed to taking on all of those efforts on our own at the city level. So you'll see that type of language related to most things in the comprehensive plan, making sure that the city is a good partner and that we're not putting up roadblocks to things that we want to see in our community. Also, thanks to Virgil Turner, um, we have a historic preservation program that's up and running. And this is really important to ensuring that we have a vibrant community that reflects the character and the history of the Montrose that we all know and love. An added benefit of this historic preservation program is that we became a certified local government this last year. That's through the state. It's a program for historic preservation through the state. We applied and we got that certification. And so that allows us some benefits through the state of Colorado. But one of the biggest benefits is that property owners now, if they participate in our historic preservation program, and just by us being a certified local government here in Montrose, those property owners can receive tax credits when they endeavor to rehabilitate their historic buildings. And so by being a CLG, we're allowing our community members some extra benefits um, that are financial and can be pretty significant. Right now, the Potato Growers Building is one of our designated buildings in Montrose. And you may have noticed a lot of great work happening over there. The aerial view that we took from a drone shows the, what the roof <coughs> looks like. Right now, they've been working on replacing the roof, which is excellent. And then down below, you can see the inside when they stripped out all the rotting um, floor. And now there's a kind of a base floor level in there. There's a roof on it. There's some skylights. And it's incredible to see what this space is going to become because of the property owners who put in effort and time and also because of the way that our community values historic preservation. Next, a little bit about community engagement, partnerships, and events. Last year, we did a lot of outreach with our community. And the main goal of this, one of the main goals, is to learn about what our community wants so that we can be able to communicate that to our staff and also our city council members so that they can make good decisions and understand the direction that you want us to go in. Um, up on the left, this is a picture from our Earth Day celebration, our Earth Week Expo in Buckley Park. Girl Scouts come every year and they plant trees, community, community members come and they have a hot dog and we talk about Earth Week activities. Um, MABA, the Montrose Area Bicycle Association comes, they do a cleanup on bikes. It's a great event, we hope you'll join us this year, that's in April. We had an outreach event um, over in the La Raza Park neighborhood where we invited city staff and also other community organizations to come and talk about the resources that are available for housing rehabilitation. And we'll continue to organize events like that in 2020 where we bring partners together and Bethany Maher, I don't know if she popped in yet, but she's our new community engagement specialist. And so that's one way we're trying to backfill Virgil's position is having Bethany who can communicate with our citizens about issues that you're seeing and also organizations so that we can have a seat at the table and understand the issues with you, even if we're not the ones driving that process at the city. There's a wonderful exhibition at CMU in the library right now um, called Photo Voice. And residents of the La Raza Park neighborhood took pictures of their neighborhood in order to show you and show us what they love about their neighborhood and also some of the challenges there. And we've learned a lot. They'll be presenting to city council at a work session um, at this next work session on February 3rd, I think. Let me just confirm. Um, yep, February 3rd. So you can come to that work session and hear about it or go down to the library and look at the photo exhibit yourself. Um, it was wonderful. And then this is a picture of one of our newcomer tours there on the right with the bus. 
Our Office of Business and Tourism organized a couple of newcomer tours last year and they're happening again in 2020. They're for people who are new to our community, but also for people who've lived here a long time and want to learn more. I think it was my favorite day of last year, getting to join all of these people on a school bus with council members. And we drove around and looked at city facilities, talked about how Montrose has evolved over the years, and got to know each other. It was really excellent. So please join us at these events. Chelsea will be talking about how we communicate information with you so that you can participate in these types of things. But we'd love to see you in 2020. Okay, so uh, this is something that I'm very proud of. Very, very proud of. Uh, this, is, this is good. So, this is an example of what resources do for our community. All right, and to give you a little bit of a background, um, the Drug Enforcement Administration put agents in our community that are directly tied now with the uh, Drug Task Force. And between the Montrose County Sheriff's Office, Montrose Police Department, and DEA within the last year. This is the result. These are 13 individuals who have been federally indicted through the U.S. Attorney's Office, and they're all facing a minimum <coughs> sentence of 10 years in prison to life for drug trafficking all in our community. This is a huge deal, and this is your federal and local tax dollars at work when we take specific resources and we apply them to a specific problem, all under intelligence-led policing. I guarantee you that by focusing on these individuals, we'll see crime reduction. And so this is awesome. This is probably the biggest set of arrests that we've ever had, really even on the Western Slope, as far as federal indictments. If you can imagine, the federal courthouse in Grand Junction only takes about five federal indictments a year for the Western Slope. We gave them 13 in one day. That's good, but that also should tell all of you that we do have a problem in our community. And it's a problem that we haven't been able to address before because we haven't had the resources. and. Uh, I'm honored that 2A passed because that's going to continue to give us the resources that we need to do the good work that we're doing in the community. So some of those things that we're doing, we're adding more officers now in specialty positions. I can tell you that since January of 2018 in the last year, we've hired 10 police officers. Five of those are in the police academy right now. Uh, we've hired two customer service techs, an animal control technician. Some of these are through attrition, so we're, re we're replacing. Some of these are not on the 2A side. We've hired two part-time animal control techs. We've also hired a crime analyst, and then we replaced a code enforcement position. All of those positions are going to be very integral to intelligence-led policing as we start targeting those high-profile offenders like these folks in our community so we disrupt them, displace them, or charge them criminally. Next, we are in the process of building a new, or actually in the beginning stages of design for a new police facility. And again, I can't tell you how honored I am that the citizens authorized the funding for that because our building is gonna make us safer, it's gonna make us work smarter, and it's going to make us more efficient so we can serve all of you better. Next, we're, we're taking a, uh, a new direction in code enforcement. I will tell you, I'll be the first one to come up here and, and admit to you, we didn't do a good job with code enforcement in the last several years. I'll take the hit for that, we didn't, but we're doing it now. And so uh, we're focusing on everything from junk to abandoned cars, to weeds, to snow removal, all of those things to make our community a, uh, a more attractive place. We're also going to use code enforcement under intelligence-led policing for some of those houses that have landlords that rent to individuals that they shouldn't be renting to 
to work with them in a positive way to maybe help those people along, maybe out of our community. So, And all of that is to disrupt offenders in our community to make it a better place. So we're doing some other things too. We haven't ever done this before, but we've created a two-hour program for uh, citizens in our community, for parents, for students, um, single moms, for sexual assault awareness, and we'll begin teaching that in February. And that's everything from online sex trafficking to um, making your kids safer at home, programs you can install on your kids' computers to help protect them when they go out on the internet. And then we're also engaged right now in our Citizens Police Academy. Uh, we have 19, I think, individuals in that right now. We've changed that up a little bit. It's a little bit more hands-on. So the students today, and I would encourage you, if you've gone through it once before, come back. Or if this interests you, please attend uh, next year. Give us a call in December, because now you can drive our cars on a track, <laughs> which is really cool. Um, you could do, a, we do a mock crime scene, we do a, 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 a shoot simulator and things like that. So all really good stuff. And then for the first time ever, we are also doing a Spanish Citizens Academy. It's an abbreviated one because we're gonna start small and kind of work through things. And that starts in February as well. And so that's gonna be awesome. Um, so we're trying to uh, do more with our community programs. And really all of that is just so that we can work with the community so that we can be better. I will tell you that every now and again I hear rumors out in the community, things like, ah, oh, you know, the police department's buying 28 cars, or we only hired two officers, and we do terrible at hiring, or things like that. I'm right here. Everybody knows where I am. I'm the police chief. I, will, I would love to go have coffee with anyone that has questions about our department. We're an open book. So if you hear something about us, give me a call, and we can just sit down and talk. I'd love that. So thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Scheid, our public works manager. Um, this is not from today. <laughs> Um, we do lots of things at Public Works, but today I'm going to talk about a couple things in our um, street maintenance program, our wayfinding program. Um, a couple names on our team, um, Street Superintendent John Keane, I believe he's here today somewhere. Raise your hand, he's in the back over there. Um, we're in the process of hiring a park superintendent right now, um, so there'll be a new name on that list soon. And then Trash and Recycle, Abel Velarde, he's probably not here today, he's very, very busy. Um, so related to streets, um, our streets crew, uh, we've kind of transitioned to more of focusing on maintenance only within our own division, and we contract out all major improvements. So our in-house crew, here's a couple pictures of areas they focus on, mainly crack sealing and patching. So crack sealing, for example, that's a picture on the left. You may have seen them around town. They, did, they were very busy this year. Um, we plan on continuing that forever. Um, but they did, in-house, we did a little over 17 miles of street, and we contracted out about another 25. So that's gonna be our, basically our scope moving forward. A little over 40 lane miles um, every year moving forward. And that's gonna cover about an eighth of the city every year. Um, so between us and contractors, we put down about 310,000 pounds of crack seal material. That's a lot of crack. Getting it off the streets and we're putting it back in. Um, patching is the other side of that. that um, in this picture, they're doing utility patch and we'll do those as well. But um, we'll, we try to stay ahead of our crack seal team and patch the road in those same areas that we're going to crack seal. Obviously, we wouldn't want to crack seal areas that are failing, so we would remove those, uh, repair them, and then crack seal behind. Um, patching is a lot more labor intensive and takes a lot more resources, so oftentimes it doesn't keep up with the crack seal crew. Um, but it's a, it's a goal of ours. We, we do put about 3,000 tons, or for 2020, we'll have about 3,000 tons of asphalt we'll put into patches. Um, and we do batch, I would say, about half of that in-house 
kind of depending on timing, uh, when we can buy it versus when we can make it. Um, a lot of times our um, deliveries are so small that we have to batch it ourselves because nobody will make such a small batch for us. Um, so anyway, that's our patching and crack cylinders. One of the main focus is related to street maintenance. Um, this may be hard to see from back there, but what this is just a map that we divide the city into eight sections, and this is where so our crack seal and patching plan by year. Next year happens to be a, a year A, which is purple, and that's kind of the southern southern region down here. So this coming year, that'll be our area of focus related to crack sealing and patching. Um, when we would do, obviously, if there's major repairs needed in other areas, we would we would repair elsewhere, but we'll focus on that area mainly for crack sealing and patching. And this is our PCI map. So I wasn't here last week, but I heard there was a question about how we um, score our streets and, and compare it to how the county does it. So um, we use a, a pavement condition index, or what we call PCI, and it ultimately, at, at the end of the process, gives a zero to 100 rating for the streets. 100 being the best, and zero being the worst. Um, and obviously, the you know above 90 is very good, above 70 is okay. Um, and that's where we've kind of put a color to those things. So the dark green is very good, light green is, is okay, yellow is fair. So um, what you can see by this is that there is a lot of green on there, but it's in the newer developed areas of town where you see most of the red and most of the um, even gray areas is in the older parts of town because they are, you know, they've been there longer, these streets are aging and what that's showing is that we haven't kept up with the level of maintenance to keep those roads from failing and and that's partly because there's been a lot of deferred maintenance related to streets um, street improvements are funded through our general fund so it's um, when times are rough that's what gets hit um, <coughs> forgot what we're going with that hang on <laughs> um, <coughs> Well, I'll try not to make that depressing is where I was going with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, the MoveMo project, that's, I guess that's something that's um, not depressing. <laughs> Scott will talk more about the MoveMo project, but that did inject a lot of money into our street improvements. And that a lot of these streets are green are because of the MoveMo project. And what we've kind of analyzed is that we would need to do a MoveMo style project every year to keep up with the rate that our asphalt is degrading. So that's, that gives a scale to the amount of asphalt we have and how quickly it degrades and how much that costs. So MoveMo was not, um, not funded through our general fund. It was borrowed money. <clears throat> and that's why something like that every year would be a lot of, a lot of money. So on to wayfinding. Um, this is another project we do in our streets department. Um, you've probably seen some of the signs like the uh, sign on the left there. There's, this is the third year that we'll be putting up these new signs. Um, very attractive. They, they fit very well. Um, they were very proud of them. This year, uh, one of the focuses is going to be on our public parking lots. So the sign on the right um, will be to identify some of our public parking lots, um, which is interesting. I grew up here and didn't know that we have six parking lots public parking lots downtown. Actually, I worked here for a whole year and I was responsible for that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, they'll be, uh, we'll identify the parking lots with signs like this and I also have directional signs directing people to public parking, um, mainly focused on downtown. A um, couple other things in the wayfinding program are like a visitor kiosk there with the map. Um, if you don't know where the downtown parking lots are, you can visit that and they are identified on there. Um, there is um, a few of these up now. Um, one of them right on Cascade in Maine, uh, one of the visitor center, and there's another one out there, um, Museum of the Mountain West. We'll be putting up a couple more of those. Um, and then this one on the right is an example of a, um, a park rule sign. So we have some of these up in River Bottoms, an example, there are some of those up, but they're, um, 
Again, one of those things you don't even know they're there. So this is kind of a way to dress it up, make it look better. And, and so people actually see it and read it. And then lastly, I wanted to mention about our uh, Better Montrose app. Um, this is probably the best way to get anything on our to-do list. So if you notice um, a street light out or a sprinkler that's leaking or anything that's um, on city property, you can make a request through this app and it links directly to the system that we use to generate our work orders for our crews. So it's the quickest way to get something on our to-do list. And, and we can comment back if there's some special situation, we can comment to you, but if not, our crew will get this request the next day or immediately. Um, so coming into this early springtime of the year, the freeze thaw process, potholes are gonna be coming, and they're, already, they're here, but they're, they'll be getting worse. And this is the best way to get a pothole request to us. We send out crews um, early springtime three times a week, and to have a quick process to get um, notified of potholes, this is the best way. So you can download it for free, and then uh, submit requests to any one of our departments to do this. So, and I'll pass it on to Scott. Thank you, Jim. Um, so I'm Scott Murphy, I'm the city engineer. Um, I'm generally responsible for uh, infrastructure associated with uh, development. Uh, I've been the project manager over the URA's infrastructure and then all of our capital, larger capital projects associated with infrastructure. So uh, here's a map uh, just to kind of recap the MoveMo effort. So uh, MoveMo stands for Moving Montrose Forward, not MoveMofo, um, but MoveMo. <laughs> Has the website movemo.co, that's kind of where we direct everybody for project updates and a lot of this information is online there. Um, but this map shows everything under this kind of umbrella that we've done for 2018 and 2019. Um, and if it felt like everywhere you went, you ran into construction, you were right. <laughs> that, that did happen. <laughs> um, so under that effort, uh, a lot of the blue roads here are overlays. Um, so those are streets that we've been able to replace the pavement on, either straight overlay or mill and overlay. Um, some of the purple are uh, surface treatments, so um, for the first time we used a slurry seal. Um, they used to do a lot of chip seals. Everybody hates chip seals. Um, slurry seals are a thin surface, kind of micro-surfacing um, sand and asphalt emulsion material. So uh, if you're wondering, it doesn't look as good as an overlay, but um, it's a lot cheaper than an overlay and a lot better than a chip seal. Um, so, you know, with that, we've been able to knock out a lot of the really bad roads, um, so you can get to the hospital now without getting bucked out of the ambulance um, on Nevada. Uh, the Hillcrest Corridor, uh, South First, that was a road that had completely delaminated. Um, North Fifth uh, Pavilion was in pretty rough shape. Um, knocking out some of the worst, um, and that's, it's been great. So this shows what we've been able to do with about $5 million, um, covers all of these kind of interior projects. Um, and made a dent in it, but we still have a very long ways to go. The maintenance backlog is over 40 million. Um, and so if uh, we ever got that money, if it rained from the sky, you'd really not be able to get anywhere. <laughs> um, and then this also includes some of our uh, larger capital projects. Um, everybody knows about the roundabout here, um, the South Hill Crest extension, uh, the Connect Trail, uh, which we're proud to say is open. And uh, uh, thanks to $2 million from GOCO and the Rec District partnering also, um, made a $3 million project uh, pretty small for us, um, $350,000 out of pocket with some of the budget savings we've had. Um, the URA work, uh, we replaced the water system out at the county subdivision where their well had failed and brought them onto our system. The green bridge replacement, which Jim did, and got rid of a sewer trunk line out here, new big 24 inch water line out here, and redoing um, the outlet works up on our, a lot of people don't know we own a reservoir up at the top of Cerro Summit, uh, built in 1912. So you can imagine the condition that pipe was in um, dating back that far. So um, brought that up to modern dam standards. That'll be, that'll carry over into next year and we'll be finished in the spring. Um, but uh, yeah, all of this represents about 25 million in capital investment over the last two years. So it's been a really, really awesome run. Um, I wish we could have that much money all the time, but when we get it, we'll take it. and. Uh, Hope you guys enjoyed what we've done with it. Um, William put together a video to recap um, some of these projects. We love videos.
everybody. Uh, this is a project that has been years in the planning. People think at least that long in the building, but it really didn't take that long. Um, and, and look how beautiful it is from the middle, the landscaping we've done. It's a bigger roundabout. Um, it's an asset to the city that is going to benefit everybody that lives here. We're on the pedestrian bridge construction site right now where Kansai is working for the city of Montrose to install a new pedestrian bridge for us. Uh, it's 100 feet long, 10 feet wide, and weighs just over 33,000 pounds. So there, there was a, an old bridge here. It was a little over 60 years old. It was constructed of an old rail car. Uh, it was much smaller than this bridge, and it was actually um, impeding on the river flows, so this replacement was needed for, for many reasons, but um, this new bridge will, will last a long, long time. So the uh, Connect Trail project is complete and open to the public. Um, proud to announce that it was about $200,000 under budget for construction. Uh, we now have full and repeated access across town and, and Main Street uh, to get our population centers over to our parks. Um, and to the Rick Center um, without having to cross either of those roads. It's been in the dream, or it's been a dream of this, of a lot of partners for more than 10 years, and uh, uh, with the help, of it, but they've never been able to, uh, to bite off a price tag that large, um, being over $3 million. And so, with the help of GOCO with their $2 million Connect Initiative grant, um, another 450000 from other community partners, um, the largest of that being the Montrose Recreation District, um, helped us to make this a uh, relatively cheap project to complete. Um, for all of the benefits that it, that it offers. And now that I'm looking at my notes, another thing I meant to mention on all that move mode work. So um, with each of our overlay projects, anytime we do a surfacing or an overlay, um, anywhere we could add bike lanes, we did. So with that, we're able to double um, the length of our bike lane network um, with really no cost. So another great benefit of this um, project. So uh, on to 2020 projects, uh, the map is a lot less clustered. Um, for, for this year. Um, still pretty decent though, $6 million of work that we'll be doing um, going into 2020. Um, you'll see uh, bridge deck replacement starting on 6530 Road. Um, pretty, anybody's driven over that, it's pretty rotten bridge deck, about the end of its life. Um, that'll be starting here in about a month. Uh, we'll finish up Cerro Reservoir. Um, right now, out by Museum of the Mountain West, there's a waterline <coughs> upsizing going on um, to replace the waterline back from the, one of the original waterlines for the city upsizing. Um, we'll be starting a waterline loop down through Cerise Park. Um, ultimately, that'll connect and give us another river crossing, um, which are pretty vital from a um, reliability standpoint of the system. River Bottom Drive is currently under construction. That was another project where we've been able to leverage um, outside money. Uh, got some money from DOLA um, to help rebuild that in conjunction with the Rec District redoing Holly Park. Uh, finally, get going on the Woodgate realignment and the property acquisitions required to kick Woodgate out to East Oak Grove. A couple overlay projects dealing with the failed sewer down here in the sewer system in the Woodgate subdivision that used to be on the lagoon and was built really subpar. Uh, we'll be uh, replacing, starting the replacement of that system here. And then the coolest looking one um, is we have a water tank up on the top of Sunset Mesa that's below grade right now. Um, it's hydraulically submerged, doesn't really work well for our system and uh, has reached the end of its life. So uh, I should put on my bulletproof vest before I say this, but. Uh, be replaced with a standpipe, which is a, a cylindrical tank, um, 140 feet tall. <laughs> um, but it'll work a lot better um, for system reliability. Um, lowest, uh, obviously, capital cost, because right now we're pumping water downhill, which doesn't make the most, or is not very efficient. Thank you. So, um, I think Chelsea is next. Good morning. Um, so as you can see, I have a really great team that I get to work with every day and so many exciting things happening. I just feel really fortunate. They're funny, we have a lot of fun together, and obviously get a lot of things done. So again, I'm Chelsea Rossi, and I'm the Director of Business Innovation and Tourism. And so really that's the Office of Business and Tourism, as Anne mentioned earlier. 
Um, we've sort of restructured the way that that works. And so now you've probably maybe seen DART out and about in the community. That's our Main Street program. And that's really what's driving business within the Office of Business and Tourism. And then, of course, we have tourism promotion still within OBT. And so that's sort of how that, how that whole pie comes together. And my team works together to promote Montrose, both in a way of tourism, in a way of business development and community development. And we have a really great team there now and a lot of things, um, exciting things happening. So what I'm gonna talk about this morning is how we think about community development, including tourism promotion and business development, how we go about our strategy for that. And then I'm gonna dive in a little bit to some of the business um, news or things that we're working on right now and looking forward to in 2020. So we have a really simple approach to community development. Um, we don't call it economic development at the city, but more community development, um, how we can sort of drive up to that mission that Bill mentioned earlier this morning. So the first thing we like to think about is the place. So how does this feel? You know what it's like when you go into a restaurant and it just feels really great. It's a place you wanna be, the ambiance is wonderful and you wanna go back there and eat over and over again. Um, or maybe if you go to a restaurant and it's not so much that. Fortunately in Montrose, we have a wonderful canvas to work with and so we already have a great starting point. But we've been working over the years to build more assets within the community that are attractive to people. This is our water sports park, which is an asset that we intentionally built into the community to promote tourism and to keep people right here um, in Montrose. And then we do other small things like a lot of the improvements that we've done on Main Street. Uh, you may have noticed some of the big planners got painted this last summer, all of the flower baskets, um, a lot of the street improvements. We've actually recently added some lit crosswalks. Some of those things that are all about the place and what it's like when you get here, the ambiance of that. So we do a lot of work in regard to that. <coughs> Secondly, we want to get the people to the place. And so also in 2019, you may have noticed a lot of the great work that <coughs> Anne and Alexis doing in community events, um, getting people out and about, ringing cash registers, ensuring that we have events that people want to attend both from within the community, promoting that quality of life that we all love, but also attracting people from outside the community to come spend their lovely discretionary income in Montrose. So of course this is uh, Funk Fest, but we had a lot of other great events. Maybe you saw things like uh, the Halloween trick or treat downtown. We had over 500 little kiddos come out in 12 degree weather to trick or treat. Uh, just a testament to how popular those type of things are. Um, and a lot of other fun events planned for 2020. If you go to Visit Montrose.com slash events. You can get a great calendar of all of that information, including the newcomers tour that Ann mentioned earlier, a lot of the county events. Just almost, We try to keep everything on that as a centralized calendar of what to do and how to figure out what to do here at Montrose. And then finally, we um, overlay that with our business development efforts. And so with the addition of Colorado Outdoors and Mira that we've all discussed, um, this morning, we've ramped up business development in Montrose in addition to all of the other stuff. And so the city really focuses on the attraction of retail um, type businesses. However, we work as partners with Colorado Outdoors. We've got Colleen here in the audience as a great partner um, and Sandy at MEDC to attract you know, manufacturers because the whole purpose of Colorado Outdoors was to attract light manufacturers who manufacture outdoor things, outdoor equipment like backpacks and fly fishing reels and things like that that you can use and test in this community. And so we're working together to attract those type of businesses in addition to retail um, type businesses in Montrose. And so we do that in a lot of different ways. We actually have some businesses in town today that are looking at Montrose um, from out of town to hopefully relocate here. We also help businesses expand within the city of Montrose to grow bigger. And we like to always foster that because that's the easiest type of business development to do. Um, we work with entrepreneurs. We sit down with people over their business plan and just talk to them about it. Think about how it might work in Montrose and if there's a niche for that here or if not, or if they can tweak it a little bit and make it better. Um, so those are just some of the things that we do. I'm not gonna go um, too deep into that, but it's a lot of fun and I get to work in sales in government, so it's always a great time. All right, so now for the big announcement. Oh, so we're not getting a Costco. <laughs> Um, I will tell you though, we do work, we do reach out to Costco and the Chick-fil-A's of the world to try to get them here. Because you've said that you want them here in Montrose and we want them here too. There would be great sales tax producers and it would be a great thing for our community. However, Costco has, and I have personally spoke with people at Costco saying, we will not locate anywhere within 65 miles of a Sam's Club. So, dang it, Grand Junction, beat us to the punch. And it's also our population base. Even though we have an, a study that was commissioned last year under our Main Street program that says we service 100,000 people in this area, 
they still don't believe that that's our population base and we need a higher population base for them to even begin looking at our community. And the same is uh, with Chick-fil-A, although Chick-fil-A has given us a maybe, but pretty much a no. So that's, uh, just wanted to dispel some of those rumors so everybody knows that's where we are with those things and also that we do actively try to reach out and discuss things with these type of businesses that our community says that they like in the community. Um, that being said, we have, you know, we do have some exciting businesses who are locating here. Many of you probably know that we've been working with Maverick. Maverick is going to be locating near Colorado Outdoors, across from the Justice Center and Pig Place on that um, southeastern corner. They're on Townsend and Grand, and they're going to be redeveloping that whole corner into a gas station. So um, I have an economics degree, and I've heard that maybe when there's more supply, uh, prices go down, but I don't know. We'll have to see how that goes. Um, we're also in the works with another gas station on the southern part of town. Um, more to come with that soon. Uh, Freddy's snuck into our community in 2019. We were a partner with them. I think they've been a great addition to that old-fashioned burger experience. And so that's one of the partners that we've worked with. Um, we're currently working with a business right now you may have seen on some of our city council uh, agendas who could be bringing almost 100 jobs to the community in light manufacturing. So that's something that's really exciting. And other businesses um, that are bringing maybe 10, uh, 15, 20 jobs to the community. And so I want to acknowledge, you know, the elephant in the room with Russell Stover and, and all of that that's happened. That's, you know, that's hard for us. And we understand, you know, what that does to affect the families. And that's our first priority is making sure that these people have new jobs and that they can remain in our community. But the great news is, is that the city of Montrose, along with our partners, have been working already to get that pipeline filling up with job creation and businesses coming to our community and we're confident that with the work of our partners um, we'll be able to make a great impact in that area. The last thing I wanted to touch on, I'm going to leave the really fun announcements for Bill's presentation at the end, um, but opportunity zones. So I've been here before talking to you about opportunity zones. That's sort of a slow burn. It's hard to see how it's really happening and what's you know happening in our community, but that's a tax incentive that was brought down from the federal government to help with economic development. I'm proud to say over our work in the last year, sort of getting ahead of the game and marketing our community across the nation and across the state, we have one closed deal in Montrose in proximity. So proximity is the first business in the state of Colorado to take on capital investment in the form of opportunity zones. So that's um, one closed deal. We have one deal under contract, which Bill will talk about at the end of this presentation for housing, which is with opportunity zone money. And then we were also named by Forbes as a top 20 opportunity zone catalyst. So as a community, um, we were listed by Forbes. We had to apply for that. It was a very arduous process and really proud to announce that um, we are one of them. So finally, the last great bit of news I have is the KP building that Ann mentioned earlier. Um, that building is under contract. So fingers crossed that everything goes well with due diligence and we see something exciting in that building, getting that vibrancy back into that uh, area of town. All right, Mr. Bell. Okay, usually annually I come and Cheney and I present the budget to you in an entire hour. I'm gonna give you three slides. So there's gonna be a lot of questions about the budget that you probably have. We're gonna be here after for a few minutes, so come talk to us. We'll refer you to the website. We'll pull up stuff on our computer. So I'm gonna go through quickly, because my favorite part is question and answer. So I'm gonna give this to you really, really fast. So as an overview, the city's overall budget for 2020 is about $61 million. That's for every fund, all the transfers, all the money that goes out of the city. This uh, pie chart right here shows the breakdown of our general non-capital and transfer money. So money that actually goes into operations, isn't transferred out for other things, and that's about $41 million. And so of that, we have about 44% of our general operations money is going to public safety, and that was what the voters asked us to do, was a minimum of 43% of our general operations to go toward public safety every year. That was part of the voter initiative when we passed the public safety sales tax, because people didn't want us to just take away what we were giving to public safety and supplant that with a new tax. So the new tax is over and above what we were already doing. And so we actually went 1% higher than that for 2020, because it made easier math, and it just seemed like the first year there were a lot of unknowns with the building project and stuff, and it made sense to give a little extra public safety. So we also show the breakdown of administration. That's the blue part of the chart. 
29% of our general is in administration. So that's all HR, finance, building services, planning services, uh, all those types of things that just make the city run and provide all the traditional services of the city to the community. And then green, 27% is public works. And those are the things Jim was highlighting, whether it's parks, streets, uh, a lot of those just capital assets that we have throughout the community that Public Works has to maintain is all under that Public Works piece. We have, are we missing a slide in here? We are missing a slide in here. I don't know how that happens. Um, so to show you our new public safety fund, that is about $11.4 million in 2020. And that's the money that is combining the 44% from our general that we're putting into this new fund. And then the money that goes directly from the 0.58% public safety sales tax into that fund. So at no time does that public safety sales tax money go into our general fund and be commingled with general funds. It has its own standalone pot of money that we actually transfer money into from the general fund. And that way, anytime anybody wants to see the detail expenditures related to public safety, it's very easy to just pull it up by that fund and you can see all the detail you would ever want to see related to public safety expenditures. So there was another slide in there. I can grab it. Okay. It's just a different. Uh, I'll just tell you what it says and then you can look at it in a second. But um, it's a bar graph. I don't, yeah. Why is it showing up? It's a different, it had to use a different program. Okay. So, Sorry about the formatting, but the this one shows the $41 million I was mentioning, and the bar uh, graphs just show you from 2016 to the budgeted 2020, um, and then the budget for 2019, you'll get to see actuals for three years, and then the budget, because we don't have audited actual numbers from 2019 yet. But that kind of gives you that trend line, what we've been looking at as far as expenditures. An important thing to highlight on this slide is green is capital improvements, and so you'll see the big chunks of green in 2018 and 19 is what Scott Murphy mentioned earlier with the MoveMo project. Capital outlay was huge in those two years because we borrowed uh, millions of dollars to catch up on some street improvements. Some of you will probably remember John Harris, our past public works director presented at the forum, <coughs> talked about $40 million of deferred street maintenance because during the down times, we had to cut a lot of things at the city back between 2008 and 2011 general fund major expenses are related to street improvements. So that was a couple catch up years for us. It's going to start leveling out and you'll see that here in the 2020 as the green chunk gets a little smaller. Also when we get grant money in and we do big capital projects there as well, then that boosts up our expenditures for that particular year, but we also have an offsetting revenue. Are you ready for the other ones? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I thought I was having issues. No, it's, I'm having issues. <laughs> okay. So now we want to quickly talk about the really exciting things that just happened yesterday. You may have already seen it in the paper. I haven't read the paper this morning or looked at the mirror. Um, but the URA board, that's the Colorado Outdoors project. So when you hear Colorado Outdoors, that means the Montrose Urban Renewal Authority. That's the entire area over there by the river and the Justice Center. When you hear Mayfly Outdoors, that's a private company that put their headquarters building there and they own Ross Reels, Evil Reels, and a lot of other investments. And they're working to attract other businesses to go into Colorado Outdoors next to them. But Colorado Outdoors is the overall project. A lot of people get confused by that. So the URA board is made up of the five city council members and then an at-large representative, which is, uh, happens to be our fire chief, Tad Rowan. Uh, we have a school district representative and a county representative, and that's Brad Hughes, the county assessor. And then we have a special districts representative, and that's Mark Plants, who serves on a variety of boards and committees around the community. So that's who makes up our URA board of directors. There's no landowners from the URA <laughs> sitting on that board. The Dragoos who own Mayfly uh, don't sit on that board and don't make those decisions. So that's important for people to understand. We set up a URA that's not driven by the landowners themselves. And so it creates the need for a partnership. And so there's a lot of communication and working together, but it's really driven by our community leaders. 
So, two exciting things yesterday. URA board considered uh, two items. One was knowing that our community survey in 2016 and all the things we're hearing in the last three years from the community, housing is a huge issue. It's risen to the top of all the issues other than public safety. And so we've been working for years to try to get more rental units into our community. So this will be the first one. The uh, URA approved uh, what we're calling the Southern Multifamily Housing Project. And it's phase one of that project, which is the apartments. So there's 96 units. This is just a rough schematic of what they will look like. Um, the gentleman we're partnering with from Range Development's name is Kurt Sukup. And he's doing some of these same style units up in the Georgetown, Idaho Springs area. And it's very successful up there. And we think it'll be very successful here. It's really important to understand these are market rate units. These are not subsidized or low income housing units. These are gonna be on the open market. Uh, the ranges he's estimating for the rentals for these would be around the 700 mark for a studio small apartment up to 1300, 1400 for a two bedroom, two bath larger apartment, which is right in our market range here in the community. We just have no rentals at all. And so this is really gonna help our employers in our community as we're all the hospital, the county, the city, a lot of our employers are trying to recruit employees in. There's no place for them to live. And if they can find a place, it's usually really old and dilapidated, and it's not anywhere that they wanna raise young kids and that kind of thing. So lately, a lot of people have been commuting in. They find places out in the country temporarily, or they live in Delta temporarily, Olathe, and then they come in, but they really wanna live right in Montrose. So we're really, really excited. This will be on the south end of Colorado Outdoors around North Ninth. So if you go on our website and you look at the uh, URA, page you'll see the plan of development and it'll show a map of the entire development and you'll see on there the south end was all supposed to be housing so really excited 16.1 million of private investment um, about 4.2 million of public investment and so uh, that's a mixture of horizontal site improvements curb gutter sidewalk parking lot and lighting and water sewer storm sewer streets curb and gutter those types of things we also approved at the ura board uh, a development agreement to put in a Fairfield by Marriott hotel at the north end of Colorado Outdoors, just past the pick place before you make the turn to head south in Colorado Outdoors. We've been working on getting a Marriott level hotel for the last eight years. We've talked to many, many site selectors and, and finally it's coming to fruition. So the URA board approved uh, a $14 million hotel with about 90 guest rooms and that'll be located there. The 600,000 was what was approved yesterday by the URA board to help with horizontal site improvements. Like I mentioned before, parking lot, lighting, curb gutter, sidewalk, those types of things that the customers and public will be using, not vertical uh, building. We don't pay for those types of things. So that brings 14 million of private investment into the community, uh, which is really, really good for all of us. Uh, we all know when we're trying to get people to come into our community, the hotels are already booked. The major ones, Hampton and Holiday Inn, are booked for the entire summer. You just can't get into those hotels. So we're really excited about that. And the city council last night approved some incentives for the hotel as well. About 164,000 of building permit fee waivers and water tap fee abatements. And then we're helping with joint marketing through the Office of Business and Tourism and we'll help co-brand. So uh, when they're advertising this, it'll obviously uh, market the Montrose community as well. And we're helping them by, uh, we'll partner with them on those things, but also building the monument, uh, sign poles and those types of things. We won't be paying for Marriott sign, but the, the foundation and the frame for that sign. Really exciting stuff. Used up almost all of our time, but we're definitely gonna stay after. So let's jump right into questions. You can hey, find all our contact info on the website. Question? Well, I saw it over here. Did you have a question? <coughs> Scott, 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 Scott mentioned the added bike lanes, which as a road biker, I really appreciate. But, then that's a big but. <laughs> on, for instance, on East Oak Grove, which is a beautiful street with beautiful bike lanes, they are always filled with rocks and glass and twigs. These street sweepers go along and do the street beautifully right into the bike lane. 
And it is really discouraging to go down that street and have to ride in the street and not the bike lane. I'm going to make Scott really happy and say that's Jim's problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for letting me know. Um, but um, we do have a street sweeping plan that we follow, and apparently on that street we must be sweeping into the bike lane. That's a good example of something the, uh, a better Montrose app could be used for. Um, but you're also always welcome to call us at Public Works, and that's something we'll we get corrected right away. Thanks for letting me know. Another question. Yeah, this is for Jim. Um, I recently got to my phone a uh, headline from Wall Street Journal that said China is going to stop taking much of our recycle. Is that going to have any effect on our program? And if so, do we do we have a plan? How to get rid of it? Um, so yes, they actually have already uh, stopped about a little over a year ago. They stopped taking a lot of our materials, um, mainly due to contamination. That's from all of the United States. Um, so as of immediately, it has not affected what is collected. Um, but what it has changed is the rates that we, um, because we, we were collecting a rebate back for recycled materials. Um, that's when the market was strong. We were actually getting some of our um, operational money is back from through waste management. But with the market the way it is now, we are paying an, an additional fee for the processing of the material because there's no market for a lot of things. Um, so in the long term, um, likely there will be um, rate changes associated with um, the collection of recycling material. Um, but in the short term, this year, no, no change. Um, so we will continue to collect everything we have at the same rate. Okay, one more question. Hey Jim, make it quick. So Bill, um, uh, I was really impressed with the all hands on deck approach um, to the Russell Stover issue. Is there any strategies you can uh, relate to us about what you're gonna do to backfill that or replace it? We've heard a lot of ideas via email and text message. <laughs> like an indoor hockey rink or indoor driving track, those kinds of things. Uh, we don't know for sure yet, but we have a lot of people working on that. So we've had CMU reach out saying they want to partner. Uh, Sandy from MEDC is leading the charge to get a corporate meeting with them at the end of this month. We've had the Colorado Workforce Center is already reaching out to Russell Stover to help their employees transition into new job skills or um, they'll reach out to Chelsea and I about small business development, becoming entrepreneurs, starting their own businesses. So it's about 400 employees at different levels of skill and different levels of pay. But thankfully, we got 15 months notice from Russell Stover, and so uh, I think we're going to be okay. And we have plenty of time to transition those employees into other things. But just know we are working on it. We've tried to publicize that so people know we're working on it to try to eliminate that fear factor for those families. Well, thank you. I'm, again, the team will all be here, right, for questions. So if any of you have questions, please just stick around and ask. We can either stay seated and ask, or those of you that need to go on, please do. I do want to make one point, something that we really haven't talked much about before. You know that if you're not on our email list to receive the notifications for our meetings on, you can give your name to Kathy Healers or Barb Biden back in the corner, and we'll get you on that email list. But also, you know, most weeks, in the back, William Woody, City of Montrose, volunteers to come take the video of our four meetings, and then those are on the city website. So when you, you saw his video a while ago with the drone and all of that, and then at the end it went to Kathy, that's because William puts all of those on. So if there's ever a, a forum presentation that you want to show to somebody else or look at again, please go on the city website and you can find that. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, City for Montrose. Next week, what's happening in 2020 in Region 10? And I bet a you don't even know what Region 10 is, so it could be a really interesting meeting next week. Thank you.